So welcome to our next edition of the Joel Blake Business Show. My name is Joel Blake and today we are talking about talent, recruitment and skills. Such a controversial subject but one that is very important to businesses in the region and all the institutions as well as the ecosystem that they all support. So today we've got three fantastic guests who are all leaders in their own right and so collectively this is going to be a powerful conversation. So firstly I'd like to introduce Susie branch Haddo. So Suzy is the Vice Principal of Birmingham Metropolitan College. That's we have right. Rachel Adams, Head of HR at B Music. It's a charity responsible for Birmingham Symphony Hall and Town Hall. And we have Suzanne Critt, former, Hello. recently retired. I'd, I'd recently to hear. retired, retired, yes, but, I'm loving it. But co-founder <laughs> of Plum Person now and uh, regional lead for the REC here in the region and also yes. Vice President of the Sun Health Chamber of Commerce. That's correct, believe, yes, well. yes. So thank you ladies, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. Such a controversial subject, as I said earlier, and one that I know that we're all passionate about in the region. And, you know, we'll be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on talent and recruitment in the region. We talk about young people, we talk about diversity, we talk about disruption in business. There's a whole plethora of things we could discuss under this subject. But what I'd like to do is maybe start with yourself, Susie, and really just kind of start back at grassroots, really, in terms of our young people. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you seeing um, from a, a college perspective, an education perspective, on, on the needs of young people, the needs around talent, and, and how that matches with the needs of business? So I think let's, let's concentrate on, on post-COVID. Mm. Um, and we, in partnership with uh, an organisation called Beat Freaks, did a piece of research with young people throughout COVID on how COVID was affecting them on a whole scale of items, but including their careers and employment. And some of the th information that's come out of that I found really fascinating. So, for example, the young people in the survey were asked to pick what was the most important thing they were looking for when it comes to their career and finding a job. And they could only pick one. And the most important thing was doing something I love. And I know there's a, a tweeness around that because, let's be honest, I really like and love 80% of my job, but 20% of it's just frustrating. And that's just the, the real world. But actually, the, the theme of that is, and I think perhaps connected to COVID as well, is actually I want to do something that I find rewarding, that enthuses me, that I, that I enjoy. The second one was obviously money. Um, and the, the, there's no sort of mistaking that. Um, and I think, therefore, one of the, particularly for... For us as an organisation, you know, we are a majority minority college. Um, we are based in Birmingham and, and throughout. We have students from some of the most deprived wards in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And really our focus is on how we can work with young students to sort of 16 to 18 year olds to help them build their confidence and to help them build the vital work skills that mm -hmm. we all say that we need. Um, for when they're coming into employment. And we can only do that in partnership with employers. Mm. So for me, a big drive through COVID and a continued big drive is around work experience, which I know, you know, I used to run a marketing agency. I know sometimes as a business owner or an organisation, you know, you, you, your shoulders can drop when you hear those words because you mm. think, oh my God, what, what am I going to do? Um, we and a lot of other colleges and universities and schools now are quite well versed in supporting firms to look at how to develop work experience. Mm -hmm. um, but unless we really do help young people to be able to understand the different careers mm -hmm. and what that might look like for them, but also to develop those vital skills, we're going to be continuing in a, in a, in a skill sort of spiral. And I think that's a really great point because education is such a broad word. You know, when we talk education, we often immediately think academics, we think formality. But I, but I also, and I certainly from my own experience, education has, a, has a many different meanings to many different young people. And, I, and if I could come to you, Rachel, on, on the fact that, you know, in the arts and culture sector, you must see the use of education being developed in, and delivered in so many different ways from a, from a creative point of view. So are you seeing kind of similar challenges that the maybe as has described? We... Um as a, as a charity, we, we have 70 staff. A lot of those staff, um, certainly before COVID, a lot of those staff came in as fully experienced arts professionals in their, in their sort of specialism. Post-COVID, and I don't think we, we are in post-COVID, no, but let's, let's use that term, we are in post-COVID. We are trying to do very different things in our organisation by bringing in apprentices, which we haven't had before, and starting to work on partnerships around work experience to offer something that is worth having rather mm. than something that's a bolt-on with a lot of very busy people. So, mm. yes, does that answer your question? Yeah, because, <laughs> again, you know, a, a, a 
apprenticeships have been slated in some, some quarters, highly um, regarded and admired in others. But ultimately, it's the, that young person going through that experience of learning how to operate in the workplace, getting the actual skills that employers actually want for the long term, and not just attracting them in and ticking the box, but actually investing in them for the long term. But then, Susie, if I could come to yourself mm -hmm. in terms of the industry point of view, how well do you think young talent is being brought into, into organisations? But then also from a maybe a wider diversity point of view of your experience of, of working as, a, as an executive recruiter, what have you seen in terms of the ability to make sure the talent stays? It's interesting because um, in terms of young people, we haven't had a huge amount of uh, experience with young people. The recruitment we did was for experienced people. Mm. Um, however, the Chamber and the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, which I'm very much um, working with, are very much into working with government, working in partnership with other organisations. And, for example, the Solihull Chamber has got a work inspiration group and we are working towards making sure that our members go into schools, go into colleges, go into other educational institutions and create a buzz create the sizzle so people want to come into the workplace mm -hmm. and they know the routes. And one of the things that Susie just mentioned was about um, the priority was to do a job that they loved. Mm -hmm. And I often say that actually if you find a job that you'll love, you'll never have to work a day in your life, mm -hmm. or perhaps just 20% of the, yes. of the <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But But actually that is about finding the round peg, round hole. Mm -hmm. And I think we get too hooked up. It's, it's just multi-layered, isn't it? We get too hooked up on knowledge and education mm -hmm. rather than skills and behaviours, mm -hmm. which is about people wanting to fit into the organisation. Mm -hmm. And in all my years of interviewing people, one of the questions I would say to them is, and why do you want to leave where you're working at the moment? And, and what are you looking for? And absolutely, it was a teeny percentage who said about money. It was about not being recognised, not working to their full capability, not having a career plan. And what we're saying about young people going into the workplace, and I'm the oldest here, I've been working for 50 odd years, and I can rem think, what I do think, it hasn't actually changed in all of those 50 years. Wow. In, okay. it, we're still having the same issues now that we had then. Mm. And I think there's a lot of work being done, but the partnership approach is going to make the change, it's going to affect the change that we need mm. throughout the um, mm. whole I saw you the nodding country. there, Rachel. Also. I I, I, the, there's something Einstein said, didn't he? You know, the definition, I think, I'm going to misquote Einstein, which is awful, but I'll go for it. <laughs> Doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Mm. Certainly at B Music, we had an equality audit, and, you know, which gave us a, you know, an action plan, which we followed. But actually, a lot of what it was telling us, we sort of knew ourselves. Mm. And it was around, I want to be recognised. I want to be recognised that I've just done my job. Mm. Because sometimes we think about recognition schemes within organisations, you can gamify them, you can do lots of interesting things with them. But actually, just turning up and doing a good job is, is what mm. should be recognised. So we, we have uh, Be Music, which is our brand, which is great. It's got a really sort of solid looking mm. brand. So we've got these B, so we've got like Be Noticed. And we've just, you have a Teams message board and we just mm. be noticed and we notice each other. And so at the beginning, you'd have like someone going, oh, you know, Susie was really helpful. And a little, because it was countercultural to what we were doing. Now, you know, it's, it's pinging away all day, which is great because people yes. are doing a really great job and other people are saying, yeah, thanks for doing that. Even if it was, mm. thank you for moving this, this big heavy item that I was really struggling with. Mm. Thank you. And, and that's, it's a really, really small thing, but it came from an equality audit, which was brilliant. And, and we've sort of said, we didn't used to do that. Mm. We should do that. Let's do that. And we're doing it, and it, and it is changing. I think as well, I think coming back to, to the point about it, you know, it hasn't changed in, in all of these years. I, I, I think it hasn't, but I think, and I, and I hate to keep coming back to the word COVID, um, but 
for me, COVID has become a little bit like a tree, hasn't it? If you, if you sort of were to cut a tree in half, we've all got our COVID rings now. And what's been clear from um, an, an education point of view and a college point of view, and from the report that we did uh, last year, is actually how that, how that period of time has affected young people. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's in a couple of things. It, it, it is around their self-confidence, their self-belief, their mental health, um, the, the lack of social interaction, and then the impact of that lack of social interaction on, on things like confidence. And we even know from our conversations with our higher education and university colleagues that they've noticed that when students move, you know, some of our students will progress on to, to university. And when they do that, for this year, our HE colleagues have commented that they've noticed that they've not perhaps had the exposure element that we would normally give because we haven't been able to because of, of all the constraints. But I think on the flip side as well, um, one of the things that, that comes out through our report is the amount that young people did through COVID that as society sometimes we don't recognise. So if you remember those headlines at the time, it was at one point, I think one of the second waves, it was it's all young people's fault. It's all young people's fault. They're out socialising. Yeah. They had all of that turn with A-levels, you know, in, yeah. out, what's going on, all of that. Um, and then, but what you still see is the amount of young people who, people were building apps to help their community. People were signing up to be an NHS responder and to help. People mm. were helping their next door neighbours. And I think the bit where we as education need to support more in partnership with um, businesses is helping young people understand how can I take what I did there and what I do in life yes. and articulate that into an interview or a CV or an application because mm. I think quite often if you say to young people say give me an example of teamwork and they'll freeze because well, I've, I've never done teamwork at work we're not asking you that and all of this shows innovation it shows creativity it shows resilience and that's what I wanted to just pick on because we're talking about young people and, and almost the next generation of employees coming into the workforce and, and therefore bringing that creativity, bringing that innovation, that entrepreneurial mindset, bringing the grit and the resilience of their circumstances and, and, and understanding how that works. But if I could just move slightly to what about those who are already experienced in the workplace who may not even have some of the, those types of creativity or innovation or the feel of, of being like that because they feel burnt out, stressed out, They've been doing it for too long. They want to change. They don't know what to do. How do we help that kind of experienced employee? How do we help them to improve their contribution to, to the work that they do uh, and to the, the organisations that they work for? Because so often we forget that, you know, older workers, more experienced workers have so much to offer, even in terms of mentoring young people, for example. But in the workplace, they're often forgotten if they're kind of a nice little steady Eddie that just gets on and does their job. So how do we really support kind of that, that, that kind of next experience level? I, I, I found in, in, in B Music we have, um, we're quite representative of, of Birmingham generally. So we do have older and young, we've had less younger, we have more younger people now working for us. But if you allow people to just be quite organic in their, in their work, older people will, we, we have apprentices and younger people coming in. We're sort of recruiting a little bit more around behaviours, still mm. skills, but around behaviours. Mm. And those, are, those more experienced, not necessarily old, but let's say mm. with age comes experience, mm. they are organically mentoring the younger people who are accepting that. Mm. And we, we do see it. It's actually really nice to see. Mm. Another thing that I have noticed, we had a real problem getting hospitality staff post um, after after lockdowns really mm. as a venue we didn't have events and then we quickly had to go back to live so it was a real struggle one of the things that we we did and we do is our younger people in the they they pretty much own the recruitment process we do interviews by zoom we put an advert out in indeed just shout out to indeed they're, they're pretty good an advert goes out for a week they, our younger team are interviewing those people and they can go from an application to first shift in two weeks mm -hmm. because our younger people said to us, that's what we want, mm -hmm. actually. We don't really want ap long application forms. Mm -hmm. We don't really want to wait a long time because everybody sort of wants us. So we just do that. So, I, so the younger people are interviewing the younger people to bring them in and they're asking the questions that they, they feel are good questions. See, I think that's a really a great practice, but for me, I'm almost like, almost thinking, oh, 
What about the, business in them, the businesses themselves and organisations themselves? What do they need to do to change? Because young people want opportunities. Young people, ambitious young people, will take the opportunities. Organisations will support talent when they see it, but also will invest time and resource to find a potential in a young person if they may not even see it themselves. But it's not always about the young people. And, and, and for me, the organisations need to be held to account on how much they're willing to change because we're also living in a different economy in a different world where business is completely different. We are, and um, I'm going to be slightly controversial on this one um, because I think we're all on a journey. And what I would say particularly, and I'm going to say it because I'm a proud Brummie, particularly in our region and our city, mm. I do see businesses coming together to help and support. You know, we run at BMET the UK's only professional services academy. We're 10 years old this year. That involves firms from across the professional services sector who have invested hours, hundreds of hours in our students, developing work experience programmes, running lectures, having students coming into the buildings to be able to see the careers and then opening up their talent pipeline to them. And there's a lot of organisations across the city mm -hmm. who are doing that. But... I do take on board your, your point, and I think what it is about, and we, pre-COVID, to be honest, I was really seeing a shift. The shift for me happened after the financial crash. Mm. And I think when we had the financial crash, a lot of us pulled in and went, no more spending on recruitment, no more spending on is young that people. Happen, is no that happening now, now though? No. Or, is, or people still, are their businesses opening their coffers? Are they still investing? Or are uh, From what we're seeing is that I am still seeing businesses invest in terms of time. Okay. So I think... The crash meant that everybody also sort of pulled back on things like work experience programmes. Mm. And actually, to see the commitment we got off the employers across our region through COVID, running live briefs, which was the first time we'd ever done mm. it, was, has been huge. And that has, that has continued. I think where firms are beginning to... Where, where we're all... It's not just firms, actually. It's where we're all beginning to connect, connect more on this sort of system, if you like. Mm is understanding the connection. So rather than saying, I'm running a work experience program and it sits here, it's looking at it and saying, right, I need to have a more diverse workforce that's more representative of our city and I'm looking for people with this skills base. So what I'm going to do is part of that solution is I'm going to work with schools and colleges and universities and I'm going to develop a work experience program that helps introduce my organization. Yeah. And I'm going to be very clear that if people it can be like talent spotting. It's like the football industry. Mm, yeah. But it's taking something like work experience and it's embedding it into your recruitment system. And I think sometimes what we do is we say, oh, that's the nice CSR fluffy bit. That's just mm. giving back without mm. realising it's the I recruitment see. bit. I mean, I mean, Susan, are you seeing that from an industry point of view? Because obviously from, from the rec point of view, they obviously they're active in terms of helping recruiters to to maybe think differently, more innovatively about how to support a business they're, perhaps? Yes, they? and they're also lobbying with um, government as well to, for, for the changes that are needed. Mm. But I absolutely agree about COVID has been a, a pivotal moment mm. and people are more attuned now to what I think is the basis of a good economy is about being kind and about recognition and about listening. And those are very simple things to, to do, mm. but they seem to be the hardest thing um, to, to, to actually bring to the board. Mm. And I think that um, where we're, we're going as far as recruitment is concerned is saying to organisations, if you want to attract a diverse workforce, you need to make sure that everything you do speaks to the people that you want to attract. Yeah, but is that happening now, Susie? I'm, it is, it really, is happening within really happening? organisations. Okay, cool. And some and and going back to this multi-layered thing, we have labour, we have skills, we have talent, and often they're put all into the same bundle. But mm. they are very different things, mm. and we have to treat them um, very differently. Mm. And we also have huge differences where we have some organisations like ASDA, 140,000 um, employees or something massive like that, they're able to put the resource in and do stuff. But if you've got self, well, small SMEs where you um, have 
few people there, they need help to be able to make mm. those connections. I, I, I agree on that. And I, I think there's a, we, we can't have a one size fits mm. all. We have to look at, is it labour that you're after? Well, let's have a look at this. Mm. I'd also like to point out that whilst we have seen the headlines about the um, lack of people, there's more jobs than there are people, this has been coming for 10 years yeah. or mm. more. And organisations that are seeing it now is because they didn't start their workforce planning 10 years ago. Did they care 10 years ago? I, I don't think they, they, they saw it. I don't mm. think they cared. So I think that they... You've got to get on board now because actually, even now, maybe too late. Mm. So how? So, sorry, go on. Go I ahead, Rachel. Go to your point about holding yourself to account. Mm. I'm just thinking we're a small, a relatively small charity. We have around about 70 full-time, you know, full-time equivalents using that term. Mm. So we're quite small. We have senior managers who want to work in. in who are committed to that EDI agenda. Mm. It comes from the top, mm. Mm. but it's not just the single person at the top, it's the top. Mm. And then you have board commitment. Mm. In, our, in our charity, one of our trustees is directly involved with the, with the EDI mm. journey. It's not really a journey, it's a culture change. Mm. She's, a part, she's great, she's a part of, part of us. We're, and we're following on from her expertise and following what she tells us. But data hold, holds you to account. If you don't check, if you look at your, you know, your, the or, organisational metrics, whether you're mm. small, whether you're large, and you think we, were, we looked exactly that looked, felt, were exactly the same before we started all of these interventions, then you know whatever it is you're doing mm. is failing. That you've got, you hold yourself to account, mm. and data will give you that. Mm. If going in, 70% of your organisation was male, white, middle aged, mm. and you did a number of interventions, and then after four or five years, it was still the same, mm. and nobody asked any questions, well, yeah, you, you probably say your commitment yeah, isn't that, there. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I think so your data holds you to account to yeah, some extent. I, I do agree. I think it does. I think. I think there's two things there. I do, I do think um, young people in particular are going to hold more businesses to account mm. on social responsibility. Mm. So I think when they're looking to you as an employer and looking at what you could potentially be offering them as their career, they want to see what does your anti-racism pr proposal and agenda and look like and how are you actually delivering on that? Yeah, that's a really good point. What does your sustainability agenda look like and how are you actually delivering on that? I think that's and, a, can, can I cut you, Susie? I think yeah. that you've hit on a really powerful point there because I was in a conversation with, with, um, with, with colleagues the other week and one of the questions that came out was who are going to be the customers of tomorrow? And it was on that very point that it's going to be the employees and, and the next generation who are going to be holding the organisations to account. Because, and again, I'm not wanting to keep bringing up COVID, but what, one thing that it did, it allowed people to understand what their values really are. Mm -hmm. yes. It allowed them to almost strip out all the things that weren't, that weren't helping them to progress. Yeah. And I'm forced to do so to a degree, but certainly allow them to really think about what's most important to me and how does that translate into all aspects of my life, including the world of work. And so the war for talent is always going to be a war for talent, but there's also going to be a, a much more larger push from the next generation to say, well, I know what I'm worth. Yeah. So you need to show me why I should work for you. Yes. Yes, but that's not, that's, that can back to this point, that's not just, a, that's not just the financials. So that's, that's not course, young people course, sitting there yeah. thinking, you know, uh, I'm expecting this type of salary, etc. Et it's the whole values it's the, it's the It's yeah. the young person wanting to understand what are your values as an organisation. And mm. it comes back to the point of, I want to do, I want to work, I want mm. to do something that I love. I don't think it's just young people though as well. I think, I I think it's just yeah. everyone yeah. full stop. Yes, I think yes. you're probably it, right. Yeah. 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 But it is the young people who are going to bring in that next wave of thinking and innovation that's going to transform organisations because they've grown up in a maybe it's arguably a different age, they've got more ideas, uh, you know, culture is, is more important than difference for them mm. in many, many different ways. But people full stop who are trying to find work, who've act actually had the time to, you know, re readdress their own their value position, they're going to do exactly the same thing. And I do think as businesses we need to, we have to yeah. look at that. And I, I don't yeah. think, yeah. We're, we're all on our journey, aren't we? But I, I I think sometimes I see organisations, particularly around apprenticeships, sometimes the clients we're working for on the larger piece, and all of us sometimes as organisations, they try and sell the job description. 
<laughs> sell the culture, yeah. sell the organisation, yeah. sell sell what it's like to, to come work here. But but on that point, um, we have been in partnership with an organisation called Leaders Unlocked across the across the uh, the UK, and that has been looking at, at race and equality in particular for young people. And one of the chapters in that report is it's just come out um, is around employment and, and and racism in the workplace. And one of the the statistics in there that I have found really hard to, to take and really hard to read, but it's, it's real and it's there, is that 47% of young people felt that, so this is young people from a BAME background, felt that certain industries were not open to them for them to be able to apply because of their BAME background. Mm. And that just can't be acceptable. And we therefore have to ask ourselves questions as to why and what are we doing about that? And well, is it because I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. of the workforce? No. And therefore, what is it that we're doing to address that? Because mm. we've got hung we have got hungry young people in our city who are going to be able to drive us forward for the next generations. And it's about removing some of those potentially perceived barriers, mm. but probably in a lot of cases, actual barriers as well. As mm. someone born and bred in Birmingham who didn't go to university, um, I worked in a factory, I got into professional services as a bit of a rebel, and, 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 as, as, as you would know. And, and, and so I completely, absolutely, because I didn't think the corporate space was for me or someone like me. Now I look at it like, hmm, my difference made the difference because I'm coming from a different angle. Yeah. I'm coming from a different thought process. I can see how, not how the game is played, but I can see how things work and I can see where I can add value. And I know there are many young people in our city ethnicity, but also gender, also with disability, etc., who think in a similar way. And I don't think it's about saying it's us against them. It's about no, let's it's create this yeah. state of inclusion where everyone can benefit, but the organisations do need to open their mindset, but also young people and older workers need to also open their mindset too. Because I know even with myself, I was conditioned by the way that I'd been brought up to a degree that okay, it's always going to be me against the world. And what I recognise is, well, if I add value to the world, then everyone wins. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and so, what's, so the purpose is about greater than self. Being all philosophical and all kumbaya about it. But, <laughs> but the reality is that we're living in a different world where inclusion means more than just a nice you know, picture of a kid on a hard hat on the front of a citizenship report. I'm not yeah, interested. Yeah. It's about... What's your impact? How are you demonstrating that? And I think ESG and other things like that, you mentioned sustainability earlier. All these types of initiatives are helping organisations to show another side of how they're adding value. However, the commitment has to be demonstrable and long-term yes, and yeah. consistent. Yes. And so I think data, your point earlier, Rachel, around data is key to that. Arguably, where they're getting the data from, is it the same data sources which then give them the same types of outcomes that they've had in the past? I'll leave that in the air. But the reality is that data and actual evidence of impact from the very people that they say they're supporting is going to be key. And I would say almost easy as well in terms of the industry. It'd be interesting to see how regulation plays a part in helping, hold, helping to hold organisations to account mm -hmm. where necessary, mm -hmm. but also enabling innovation to thrive so mm -hmm. that the state of inclusion can create change for all. I, I'm a great believer that if we had inclusion, we would, wouldn't need equality and diversity. I think that that's mm. the, the most powerful one. And the data side of it, recruiters have got masses of data that could be used that employers aren't using on terms of their their reputation in the marketplace. And they, they're not it's hearing really that. Context, and yeah. they need to reach out and say, well, wh what, what's my reputation? Because we have people, no, I don't want to work for them. Why yeah. not? And the company oh, would be a poor, yeah. it's yeah. absolute yeah. gold yeah. dust. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because of X, Y, Z. And we can um, help influence the changes mm. that need to be made to make them more attractive to the people that they want to mm. get in there. And also we can do it the other way around of giving, giving the real information, not the information that they captured at exit interview. It, yeah. And when I hear things like, um, yes, absolutely, Edie and I committed, and then they say um, on feedback after an interview, I just don't think they're the, quite the right 
fit. <laughs> so, mm. so, so what do you mean about the right fit? Mm. And actually, nine times out of ten, it's, I don't think I could manage them. And then that's another conversation about leadership skills, being able to have difficult conversations, having confidence to be able to manage people and manage a diverse workforce. And just on that point, and a question to all of you really, and should anyone feel free to answer, do we feel or do you feel we have confident leaders in our region for that exact reason who would be willing to kind of almost show their vulnerability in order to learn and to grow and to, to support that diversity. I think there's a lot of imposter syndrome um, mm. and I think there's a lot of people who are winging it as well mm. and really do need help. Mm. Um, and I think that perhaps it's not having the confidence to reach out mm. and saying, I don't know how to do this. So that's where collaboration plays a Absolutely. huge part then, doesn't it? In Absolutely. Terms of, and and ju no, just, I mean. just sorry, that the, the other thing is about flexible working. So mm. many people now working from home, you've lost that osmosis of learning and, and seeing and hearing and having the opportunity to be mentored by other people within an organisation. That's diluted now. So again, we, we're going through, we, we thought we had a challenge, now we've got an even bigger challenge. And, and, and managing that. But I think um, we do have some fantastic, confident leaders who are more than capable, but we also have a lot of people who perhaps have been promoted because of their talent, but not because of their skills in managing and bringing the best out in others and remembering to say, thank you, you yeah. did a great job today. I'm really yeah, proud of you. Thing. I think in small in smaller charities, people often get promoted because they're good at their specialism. And then, mm. if they have an interest in management, that's great. Rather than, are you interested in being a manager and mm. being promoted on those management skills? Because you can treat sometimes you can train the specialism into somebody or mm. whatever. Mm. I think that that is that's been going on for as long as mm. I've been working, and I, I think mm. it predates me. Certainly in those smaller places, certainly in smaller charities and businesses. Mm. But I think you are seeing. You, I, I agree with everything. Um, but I think, for me, I am seeing strong leaders across the city, in particular in Birmingham, but also um, a different type of leadership style and a different yeah. type of leader. Um, and I think what it's about sometimes is actually those leaders who, and, and the people I'm referring to, like you've just said, have actually got to that position because of their, their ability to, to, to look after people, not perhaps just based on their technical skills. Um, but what it's about is then that leader having the confidence and the support around them to be able to start publicly shouting about things that they're yeah. doing. Yeah. So there's a very large uh, law firm in the city and uh, they have two, female two females who have shared the role of senior partner. And they are very vocal about that and they are inequivocally female and they've got one of them has got a young son mm. and they they're, they're very public about it and I think that is absolutely marvelous mm. because that is for me about showing what can be achieved absolutely. and demonstrating it and not trying to 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 fit a box. To, to, to fit yeah. to fit a box and I think with the flexibility point I think it's really important because I think with COVID I do think there's been a bit of, I think the next journey we need to go on is I think some people do think that flexible working is working from home. And it's not. It's not yeah. at all. And <laughs> I, have, uh, I, have a, I have a young son. I have a, four, a five, well, he's five this weekend. So I have a young son. Um, and my, my son also has learning disabilities. And that means, therefore, that our school days look different a little bit to mainstream school. Um, I'm really fortunate that I'm in a cultural environment where I can have flexible working patterns. So I've dropped my son off this morning, I've come here, I've got a commitment this afternoon, I've got a commitment this evening, but I can flex around it. Mm. But I do think that there is a bit of a... I get really irate when I hear people mm. saying it's all about working from home. I, I don't think that's... I, I just don't think that that is possible. I think it has to be... Sometimes it is about working from home. Mm. I had a tender to do on Wednesday, that was a working from home day. Um, but it's that, it is that flexible working mm. that, that we well, need to think well, about. Well, I think, I agree. you know, as we, as we kind of, I guess, come to the end of today's show, I think what I'm hearing is a number of different key things. And I'd, I'd like just to give a final thought just to share, share with businesses and our audience who are watching. 
But I think what I'm hearing is there's this combination of collaboration, data, yes. and inclusive leadership. I think the combination of those three things can really help to create a new way of thinking within organisations, but also a new way of thinking from the people who are trying to find work as well, whether it's a young person or a much more experienced person who's trying to think about career change. Um, but as a final thought, what, what would you think? If I start with yourself, Susan. I was just going to say, um, for th those SMEs out there, you are not alone. There is such a lot of support out there. Um, at the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, they do a, re a good recruitment charter. You can follow that to, and there's an audit that you can have to see how good you are, where you need to, to actually do stuff. There's also uh, business in the community and they have um, uh, principles that you can work to. You don't have to start from zero. Mm -hmm. There is lots of support out there um, and reaching out to the colleges and reaching out to the, the chambers, all of those things can help you um, in, in actually making the next step. And I think there's a real willingness there in the business community, in the community, yeah. Um, Just be open to collaborate. Absolutely, Perfect. absolutely. Rachel? Also, to, I'm just thinking in a really small way, as a, as a small charity, you, we talked about data, you know, the data shows the change, but there is, that's quantitative data, there is qualitative data. Ask yeah. staff and be open to listening to what they have to say and be prepared to make those changes. Mm -hmm. That's not easy. But if you, if you give staff the networks and the possibility to communicate, speaking truth to power mm. and being open to changing I think that's that's really important because you've got to if you say you're going to change you've got to be the change but you've got to give channels to make that change happen so actively yeah. listening and actively doing as well and actively being uncomfortable mm. Mm. because if you're not mm. you're, nobody's got it right so if you're not actually uncomfortable by somebody speaking truth to power unless you've brilliantly got it right brilliant let's all let's all be that organization like actively uncomfortable I like that. yeah I like that as well yeah. <laughs> and last but not least, Susie? Um, I think it's about understanding about being in it for the long term. Mm -hmm. So I think it just comes yeah. back to the point earlier, which is um, we've known about this for 10 years. Um, so if you're, you know, my advice would be invest in young people now, investing partnerships. And of course, I'm going to say with your local colleges now, because it's where I'm from, but from you know, invest in education now. But don't expect to see the investment and the return on that investment in the next six months or 12 months. As I say, these partnerships can be 10 years, but you need to do that because this is about a talent pipeline. And you know, let's think about the football industry. It's the model that they've been running for, for years and, and it's grassroots investment and then, and then up there. So it, it's sometimes I do see firms getting involved, getting really excited and then sort of feeding back. Oh, we, we've not had it back. You know, yeah. we've, we've not seen what we wanted. How long have you been working with that college organisation for? Three yeah, yeah, you're just not going to see it in three months. Well, <laughs> so ladies, think long term. Well, ladies, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for your insight. Thanks for your expertise. I'm sure our audience have picked up so many gems from you all. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, and for thank all you. of you, for all of you who've been watching today. Um, this area is one that is always close to my heart and, and, and you know, the heart of our guests today. But the reality is that business is business, but what type of business are you running? Are you running a business that is just commercial? Are you thinking about social impact? What do you really stand for? What are your values? And do those values match the very people that you want to support? Until the next time, thank you very much. Thank you.